When I heard what the Japs did to Crump, I knew I could never surrender. I knew what would happen if I got caught. And there were a couple of things I wanted to live for. But deciding to keep on living didn't solve the problem of how I was going to live. So far, I'd been lucky with the natives I'd met. But the reward on me had been raised to 1,000 yen and the Shamors were starving. I, I never knew when one of them might decide to feed his family by turning me into the gap. And then Joe told me about the one man he said I could trust, uh, a man named Antonio Attell. I went north to Antonio's ranch. Early one morning, he and I scaled a cliff that rose sheer from the sea, and, and there on a ledge high above Agano, he showed me a cave which would be my new home. You have seen the Supreme? Find him out along the coast. There's a gunner, Arnold Point, two miles, Silver Town, the road to Peninsula. Well, that's a great deal, woman, in more ways than one. What do you mean? Well, uh, isn't that smoke from Jap ships over there? Ah, it must be. Well, I really have the inside dope on what they're up to. If I ever get a chance to use it. Yes, yes, you will. You will see everything. Yeah. But uh, how high are we, Antonio? Well, if you fall, you fall 300 feet. I wasn't that tall if I were to do. No, I remember that. Well, I guess I'll start getting settled. And I will go home to my wife, where she gets worried, do something right. I will see you one week from today, Mr. Pete. Oh. Hello, Antonio. Hello. <laughs> well, you're back early. It's only been two days. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, I thought I must see how you are. Oh, I'm all right, just as you left me. Oh, yes, I, I see that you are. I also brought news. Good news? No. Your, your friend, Tyson. Hey. They got him? Uh, your friend, Tyson, and Sister Johnson. How did it happen? Their best sister is back. They came to the hut where your friends were living. The friends had no guns. They came out of the hut with their hands up. The jack shot them through the head. Poor old Christ. What a lousy guy. Now, Mr. P, you are all that is left of America now on the island of Guam. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the worst. <laughs> time I was sick at heart. I, I was afraid of everyone. I slept with my gun by my hand. But I still woke up often, straining to hear what I thought was someone climbing my cliff. Stowed away in my gear was an alarm clock. I, I took it apart, fixed it so the alarm would ring at any time. Then I stepped out from a pago tree and made a cord 300 feet long. I strung the cord from the button of the alarm clock to a tree at the base of the cliff. It, it was a tree that had to be grabbed by anyone scaling the cliff. That was what I wanted. I had an alarm system now. Now one could scale a cliff without warning me. There it goes. I wonder who... Where's my gun? Who is it? Stop for It's me, Antonio. Oh, Antonio. <laughs> Did I surprise you, Mr. P? <laughs> no one can surprise me now. Uh, I thought I had something. Yeah. Was it the bell? Yeah, let me show you. You see this clock? Ah, I see. Well, when you pull on that little tree, the bell rings. <laughs> you, you make things like a Robinson Crusoe. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm kind of proud of this one myself. Well, what brings you up on Sunday, Antonio? Is there something wrong? There is another notice put up everywhere by the Jeff about you. What does it say? Anybody suspected of helping you get shot. Well, that's not exactly news. You knew that when you took me in. The notice said they killed the man who helped you and his family, his wife and children, his wife and children. And more, the Jap will also kill 100 tomorrow from the district in which you are found. Mr. Freed, my wife, she worries. She say I'm mother. Tell you, I I understand. Well, that's that, I guess. I, uh, I kind of hate to... What were you... Will you help me pack my stuff? No, do not be angry. You think I'm sorry to you? No. It's just that I'm not going to let you take any more risks for me. Yeah, but where will you go? Oh, I don't know. They should kill you, Mr. Tree. Well, it's better for me to be killed than you and your whole family. Oh, Mr. Tree, no. No matter what my wife says, you cannot go. I cannot let you go. But I'm told you. Yes. Open this side, darling. My wife and my children. He needs many other sides. You must not die. For as long as you are here, we know the Americans will come back. That is our only hope. 
Well, that did it. And away from then on, I was no longer a hunted animal. I, I trusted someone. I had a friend. The Japs were still scouring the island for me, but I watched and waited for the American Navy. It was the thing I lived for. But all I saw were Jap ships steaming into the harbor, Jap guns being set up along the cliffs. I saw and remembered. A year passed and another year. And then on June 11th, 1944, for a minute I heard them, I knew they were American planes. It was the proudest day of my life. The planes came over and bombed again and again. And then on the fifth day of the battle, standing off the island of Guam, I saw the American Navy. The planes had given me my first wild hope, but the good old Navy would get me out. And each day from then on, American destroyers passed by lookout, circling the island. So I made two flags from a roll of gauze bandage. And each day stood from dawn to dark in the highest point of land, waving my flags until my arms ached, shouting myself voiceless, staring through tears as the ships disappeared. A week went by. Another week. Nearly a month. And no one on the ships had spotted me. It was July 10th when I remembered something I had learned to do in case of shipwreck. I, I ran to my coat and took out a small hand mirror. And as I stood in the late afternoon sun, flashing the light from the mirror across the bridge of the destroyer, I said over and over again, God, make them see me this time. They have to. They should see me. Here I am. Here I am. There are flashes of light from that cliff. Someone's trying to signal us. Can you make out what they're saying? Yes, sir. Jack, have battery of gun. Angular point. Also, gun emplacement to me at a rate eight point. Mm, this is good to know. Is there more? Have more information. Can you take me aboard? Who is he, I wonder? It might be a fixer. Yes, you're right. Well, we'll chance it. More about. took me aboard. I couldn't even wait long enough to tell Antonio. That, that worried me. On board ship, I got new clothes, a shave, haircut, and a mount in the back bay. And then before the Marines had landed on Guam, I was shipped back to the United States. The Navy had plans for me. I made speeches at the Legion of Merit Medal. This was very exciting. But all the time, I was worried about Antonio and my other friends in Guam. And then the Navy sent me back on a tour of duty. Hey, Antonio! Antonio Atera! You're calling me, mister? Huh? <laughs> What's the matter, Antonio? Don't you know me with a haircut? Tweet! Tweet! It's Mr. Tweet! <laughs> oh, 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 it's good to see you. <laughs> well, thanks. I, uh, I talked the Navy into sending me back. It's swell uh, to know you're okay. Yes, we are good, but it was close. You know, Antonio, I want to tell you something. Tell me, Mr. Tweet. I was stationed on Guam a good long time before the war. But it wasn't until I was hiding out those two and a half years that, that I really knew the island. Yes, you so much, so much of it. You crawl all over the island on your hands and knees. No, no, I... I mean that I really knew your people. It's your morals. I learned a lot from you, Antonio. Then? What, Mr. That your people are as loyal and brave as any people that live under the American flag. They made me a hero back home, Antonio. But I know the people of Guam are the real heroes. Not me. Our thanks to you, Tester Morris, and to all members of tonight's DuPont Cavalcade cast. Fighter planes fly 400 miles per hour, and the shooting star, the new jet plane now going into quantity production, reportedly tops 700 miles per hour. When the pilot of a plane traveling that fast pulls out of a dive, or makes even a moderately sharp turn, it's like reaching the bottom of a dip on a roller coaster. He's jammed down on his feet. The blood in his body is forced down into his legs, so that they swell from almost twice their size. And he faints, blacks out, only for a couple of seconds, but... In those seconds, he can crash. 
or an enemy flyer can shoot him down. So Army fighter pilots now wear an anti-blackout suit under their other flying clothes. It looks like a football suit with lacings and leg pads. When the plane pulls out of a dive or makes a sharp turn, parts of the suit are automatically pumped full of air, hugging the pilot tightly around the lower part of his body and clamping down on his legs to keep the blood where it belongs. Wearing the suit, he doesn't black out. Naval aviators wear regular summer all-nylon coveralls, which incorporate anti-blackout features. The Army and Navy have been working on blackout suits for years. About a year ago, during an airstrike in Palau, a whole squadron wore them as an experiment. But they were so hot and uncomfortable that the pilots didn't like them. They had to be redesigned for lightness. The suits in use today are unbelievably light. One weighs three pounds. Another weighs only 12 ounces. The answer is DuPont nylon, which combines great strength and toughness with extreme lightness and weight. The DuPont chemists who provided the world with a new material in nylon weren't looking for nylon. They were searching for knowledge. And in this case, knowledge about giant molecules and the way small molecules could be hooked together to make them. Out of their skillful research, out of their months of patient investigation, out of their pooled knowledge, and the fact that the DuPont Company was willing to venture millions of dollars and wait years if necessary for any return, came nylon. Because of nylon, these lightweight blackout suits are possible, and parachutes and glider tow ropes, and dozens of other things the Army and Navy would find it difficult to replace. Here is a forceful illustration of the value of pure research, Research seeking knowledge for its own sake. Research out of which ultimately come many of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. Next week, the DuPont Cavalcade will bring you one of Hollywood's loveliest stars, and one who deserves the high place she holds in your affection, Miss Irene Dunn. Irene Dunn will appear in a new radio play about the adventurous young American woman physician, Dr. Catherine Neal Dale, who braved the unknown to fight for 40 years superstition and disease in a foreign country. Listen again next Monday night to Irene Dunn in Doctora in Mexico on the DuPont Cavalcade of America. Chester Morris, star of tonight's DuPont Cavalcade, may currently be seen in the new Columbia picture, Rough, Stuff, and Ready. Music for tonight was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Our cavalcade play was written by Morton Wishingrod. It was based on the book Robinson Crusoe, USN, by George Creed and Blake Clark. This is Gene Whitman inviting you to listen again next week to Doctora in Mexico, starring Irene Dunn on The Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. of the National Broadcasting Company.